Hi. So we do quite a lot of work with the local schools. We give talks, run classes, do STEM projects in the summer, and let the kids come here to do experiments uh, with their teachers, obviously. Uh, so we do a fair bit. And um, recently, uh, I was lucky enough to be given this on long-term loan from King's School of Canterbury. It was arranged through a friend of mine in their DT department. So thank you very much to King's School. It's really well appreciated. And I'm going to use this to do some experiments with our plastic lab. But when it arrived, it arrived with an instruction book from the uh, late 80s, no, late 70s actually, and this thing has the control. So when I had a look at it, I said to the guys, what I'll do is I'll rewire it with some uh, modern controls when they get it back, and it's been improved. So it's, it's part of the payback for having been loaned it, if you like. Now, while I was doing that, it occurred to me that actually I do this kind of thing a lot where I take some of the old machinery and repair it and bring it back up to spec so it can be used. Because with this thing, which is basically just a variable resistor, then, then you are effectively guessing what the temperature is and you have very poor control over it. So if I put some modern electronics in there, we know what the temperature is and we can control it an awful lot better. So I essentially pulled this out and replaced it. When I do that, I, I'm doing that with a whole host of machines all of the time because the principles well, they're all the same. There are only five basic components, and three of those are switches. So I thought I would share that with you, because what it is that I did here, which we'll go through, is the same thing that you would do with something like a filament extruder, for example, a hot plate, a kiln that you would do with a kiln, a hot press, obviously the injection molder. So all these high temperature devices that you all might want to make use exactly the same control electronics. So I thought I'd go through that, talk about them, talk about how they work together, and give you a couple of exam examples. So it all really begins um, with this stuff. This is resistance wire. This particular wire, actually, is a cancel wire. It's an A1 cancel. I use this a lot in my kilns. It arrives like this, I make a coil out of it. And the coil is just a long coil with two ends. And it, I pass a current down there, there is a resistance, and it will get hot. Now, cancel is quite popular. This is a nichrome wire. I use nichrome quite a lot, and that's a, quite a lot of nichrome wire for doing another one of the kilns. <coughs> because I've done this for about, I don't know, three, four years. Uh, I've made three kilns, repaired one of my kilns a couple of times, um, made a couple of hot presses. Uh, obviously, I've done the induction machines. I do a lots of this. Now, if I were to take a bit of this wire and just make a clip out of it, then I'd get a stretch like this. This actually is uh, the heating wire from a sealing unit. So this is a bag sealer. And it's just a strip of nichrome wire with a couple of tabs on it. And if I pass a current down there, that'll get hot. Now obviously, I don't want to pass much current down there because it's not that resistive. But if I put about 12 volts down there, that'll get hot enough to melt plastic. And if I take something like this, and this is a cancel very fine wire, it's about 10 meters of it, Put about 12 volts down that little thin wire. That would make a really efficient um, polystyrene cutter, for example. So something like that is very, very easy to make using voltage control. That is, just stick 12 volts down it, we'll get to a certain heat. Now you can work that out using Ohm's law. Uh, if you use Ohm's law, you can work out what the resistance is, what the amp draw is going to be, and then what's appropriate to put onto that. Now, the heating element themselves are always essentially the same. They're just a bit of wire with two dangling ends. And this is something that I took out of a Chinese-made hot plate. What it is, is nichrome wire wrapped around a little bit of mica. And you can see that there, and there's the two dangling ends. I attach one to the live, one to the neutral, flip that switch, turn it on, and that will get hot. So that is a hot plate, actually. Now, <coughs> they come in different sizes, so you can get them like this. This is a flat plate cartridge heater. So here we have our two dangling wires, one live, one uh, neutral, one um, positive, one negative. Doesn't matter, AC, DC. Goes in here under the coil and that gets hot. And that's a little flat plate cartridge. This one, it's around a bit of copper pipe. You can see it's a band heater. So it's a little band wrapping around there. And here are the two wires sticking out here and here. And that band heater is a smaller version of what's actually in there. If you look in here, It's just a much bigger band heater right there. So you can get them in a band form, you have a flat plate form, a cylindrical form, or the bare wire that you wind the coil up with. 
However you get them, they're all going to be the same. They're going to be some kind of shape, and you're going to have two dangling wires out of there. Now, it doesn't matter which one goes to negative, which one goes to positive. It doesn't matter which one goes to live and which one goes to neutral. One of them goes to live, the other one you attach to neutral, and it doesn't matter which one. So the heating element will arrive in many different forms, and sometimes you'll make it yourself. So when I want to make my kiln coils, for instance, I take this, a bit of steel, put it in the lathe, and just wind my own coil. Then I stretch it out and put it in my kiln. So sometimes you make the heating elements themselves. This is a bit more difficult to make, so I bought the band element. If I wanted to make a flat element, I would just do it just like that one there. So you need some kind of heating element. And as an example, we're going to use this flat plate ceramic <coughs> heating element. It isn't really ceramic, it's got a ceramic top and bottom with a coil of wire in the centre. But we're going to use that as an example. And that's one of the components we need. Now, if we're doing something low power, so we have 5, 6, 12 volts, you don't really need to worry. A lot of this machinery runs from mains. Now, in mains, one thing you don't really want to do is flip a switch. Because that's just scary. You don't want to flick it in, turn on the switch, directly feed it into there. What you want is a safe way of doing it. And that's exactly what this is. This is um, a solid state rectifier. And it is just a switch. So if you look at a solid state rectifier, they're all, they're all the same, incidentally. You'll see they've got four pins. One, two, three, four. They'll be rated for different ampage. So it's 20, 25, 40, 60. But different amp ratings on there but they'll all be essentially the same. They'll look like that, there'll be four pins. Pins three and four are, are where you put a DC signal in, and this one takes three to 32 volts. So anywhere between three and 32 volts, if I put an on signal in there, it'll switch on my power here. So I don't have to handle high voltages like 120, 240 volts. This handles it for me. So I put that in between my supply and me and the switch I'm going to press, because I press this switch on this side at 3 volts, it turns on the power on this side at 240 volts, I'm nice and safe. So that is one of the switches that you need. Now, we do want this <coughs> to have some kind of sensor. We want to be able to register what that temperature is and make it switch depending on what that temperature is. And what we use is a thermocouple. Now this is a very common type of thermocouple, you don't see them very often, it's a K-type. And right at the end of that thermocouple are where the two wires, the two different metallic wires, are just joined at that end. That end forms a junction, and there's a direct linear relationship between the change in temperature and the voltage generated at that point. And I can read that voltage and use that voltage as an indicator of the temperature, particularly as it's linear, and it's linear in the uh, range that we want it to be for a K-type, that's somewhere between 100 and 1300 degrees centigrade. So most of the stuff you're going to use, I'm not going to use a specific um, de uh, scary, funny kind of thermocouple. Most of them are going to be K-type thermocouples. Now this is meant for a meter, so it's bare. And it's just to show you what the actual thing looks like. You don't often see them like that. Normally they arrive in something like this. This is encased. So that little bare wire is right at the bottom here. It's in this case because this is actually one taken from a kiln. So it goes on the back of the kiln, points to the bricks, and points into the kiln. And you can see it's nice and clean here, and dirty here, because that's where it's been in the kiln. But essentially, it's an identical thing. It's just a little twist of wire right at the end here, two wires coming out, and they've handily labelled them blue and red for you. <laughs> Most of them are labelled blue and red. And if they're not labelled blue and red, you'll see the wire is often red and black, or there'll be a red stripe and a black stripe on the wire telling you which one is which. So that's our sensor. Our sensor is a K-type thermocouple. Now we feed the sensor into something. And what we feed it into are these little control units because somebody's done all the hard work for us. These PID controllers are available on eBay. For, uh, you could buy them for a couple of pounds. They, all of this stuff is really cheap, actually. None of it's expensive. This can be bought for a couple of pounds, depending on the rating. If you go to an extreme rating, then you're going to pay more. But when you're looking at the mid-range rating that most of the heat, these heat machines use, Somewhere between two and five pounds is what you're going to pay. And they're all the same. They all have ten pins at the back. Sometimes you only have eight because this, these two pins here are often used for an external alarm. So pin six and seven, which are missing here, are the external alarm pins. 
That's just this particular one. I never use the external alarm anyway. It's just a trigger to sound a sounder if I wanted to, and I never use it. All I actually use are pins 9 and 10, 1 and 2, 4 and 5. So I use pins 1, 2, 4, 5, 9, 10. They're the only ones you really need to use. Is you wire 1 and 2 directly into your supply. So you're live in, live out at 110 to 240 volts wires straight into here. Your thermocouple wires into here, which is pins number 9 and 10. And it tells you on the thing which way around to put it. 9 is always the positive, or the red one. 10 is always the negative, or the black one, going straight to the thermocouple. So 9 and 10 wire straight in there. And you find that these thermocouple clips are actually just the right size to fit straight in. So you wire them straight in, bolt them down, and that's your sensor and controller. And you should get that for somewhere like five, ten pounds. This goes where you want to register the heat. So this particular one is a kiln, goes into the kiln. And this particular one, on there actually, has a little metal case of just over that black end there. And that little metal case is sitting right against the band heater. So it's sitting right here against the band heater to read the temperature of the band heater, because that's the temperature I want to read. So that goes to where you want to read the temperature. Now you may not necessarily want to read it there, but it goes where you want to read that temperature. So once you've got this, and this really is just a temperature control switch. So it reads the temperature and sends an on signal to the rectifier. And when the rectifier receives its on signal, it switches to switch on the heater here. So we now have this thermally controlled. Now the rectifier always gets wired to pins four and five, and again, if you look on it, it'll tell you which way around it is. Four is the positive, five is the negative. If you look on here, you'll see four is the negative and three is the positive. So when you wire them, pin five goes to three, pin four, sorry, pin five goes to four, my apologies, pin four goes to three. So it's plus to plus, minus to minus. That's all you have to do. So you wire these two pins to this, you wire this to these two pins, you wire this one side to your heating element. Now when you've done that, you're pretty much ready to go. So you've got your neutral coming in. Now I don't normally put the neutral straight in, I normally put it on a double pole switch. So I have a neutral switched and a live switch. It comes into the switch. On the other side of the switch, the live comes out and one goes to here and the other live goes to here. The neutral, one goes to here, the other neutral goes to here. And that's your wiring. As simple as that. So the neutral goes to the neutral lot that's coming in on your impact. Your live goes here on pin one of your SSR. Pin two of your SSR goes to your heating element. And that's it. It is that simple. So now let's have a look at the internals of this. Okay, so here it is. There's my band heater right there. And the thermocouple wire is here because the thermocouple is sitting right there. The wire just comes up and goes through the hole in here. So it's that sitting in there with that silvery wire going through this plate. So if we turn that around, you can see it. There we go. And that's the thermocouple wire there coming out. And here you can see it wired into pins 9 and 10, right there. So that's pin 9, that pin, that's pin 10. So all I've done is taken those two ends and screwed them into 9 and 10, right there and there. So that's all that is. Now, when that's done, it's actually relatively trivial. There's the SCR sitting right there. So if I look at that, there we go. It's pins 1 and 2, so it's sitting like that. So 1 and 2 is here. These two are my AC live. So the live comes from the switch. So here's the switch here, double pole. I've got live on this side, live on this side, neutral on the far side, neutral on the other side. The live comes in from the supply at the bottom. The neutral comes in from the supply at the bottom there as well. As well. The live out from the switch is at the top. The neutral out from the switch is at the top. So that's the neutral out coming there. One neutral out comes into here. One live out comes into here, wired into pins one and two. Doesn't matter which way around they go, incidentally. 
So you wire those into pins one and two up here. The other neutral is attached directly to the heating element, which is this silvery wire here. So this is the heating element. One neutral is attached directly to that heating element. The other side of that heating element is actually on the SSR, which is on pin one on the SSR. So the neutral attaches to one leg of the heating wire, the other leg of the heating wire, and again, doesn't matter which way around they are, goes to the, uh, the pin one. Pin two takes the live from this switch. So the live from this switch goes to pin two, and it also goes to here. So two wires come out of the live, two wires come out of the neutral, one here, and one attached to the leg of the heating element. So once you've done that, you have put three switches together. One, two, three. This is a manual switch, so I can turn it off and on. This is a temperature control switch, and this one is a digital control switch, and it's this one where the power comes in and out of from the live supply. And that creates a very safe um, environment for you to work in, but also allows you to control that using just those few elements. Now, all of this is actually on the um, bit. When you buy a bit, you get a picture, and the picture tells you where to wire those things to. It can be a bit confusing, so it um, sometimes shows a bridge with a, a resistance bridge and then the alarm bridge, and you're not too sure which way around it has to go. When it matters, they show you. So 4 has a plus, 5 has a minus. On the 8 and 9, uh, 9 and 10, sorry, you've got minus and plus, showing you which way around to do it. On 1 and 2, which is your live, uh, live in, doesn't matter, so you just put one in one and the other in the other. And on um, Six and seven, you never use them. So again, it doesn't matter either. There's a picture on the actual device to show you where to use it. The same thing here, the picture here to show you where to use it. Three and four are plus and minus respectively for DC in. One and two are just the break in the live that is the switch. So live in, live out. So your live in comes from the supply and your live out goes to the leg of the heater. So it really is that simple. So once I've done that, what we have now is a very nice injection molding machine that has a digital control so I know what temperature it's at and so I can control that temperature. Anyway, I thought I'd share that with you because that technique is used for just such a range of equipment and for updating old equipment. So I recently bought a kiln and the kiln I bought was for £200. I rewired it with some control electronics for £20. I bought some £50 worth of cancel wire and I have a, um, for £250 I had a kiln that would otherwise have cost me £5,000. So it's worth doing because you can take this old equipment, update it, rewire it and make some great use out of it. Anyway, I thought I'd share that with you. I hope it was of interest and thank you very much for watching.